Welcome to Thou Shalt Not Suffer, the Witch Trial Podcast. I'm Josh Hutchinson. And I'm Sarah Jack. Today's episode will inform you on the current witch hut situation in Malawi. Learn about the nation. And the prevalence of witchcraft belief there. Hear about what Malawians believe about witchcraft. And become informed about what the law states about witchcraft accusations and the reality of the violence against persons accused of witchcraft. Wonderful talks about why many victims are jailed. And how he and others have worked to free and rehabilitate people imprisoned long-term following witchcraft accusations. This is another very educational episode. We hope you'll take what you learned to heart. Witch hunting is a global crisis, and we all must work together to solve it. Welcome advocate and author Wonderful Kuche. He is the executive director of Humanist Malawi. He has a master's degree in political science and a bachelor's degree in theology and religious studies. He is a professional editor and biographer and has published several books on politics and religion in Malawi. Thank you for hosting me. My name is Wanda Kuche. Uh, I work as the executive director of Humanist Malawi. It's uh, the only uh, humanist organization in Malawi. Uh, about my background, I have a, a master's degree in uh, political science and then a bachelor's degree uh, in theology and the uh, religious studies. I have written uh, several books, Politics and the Religion in Malawi. So these are short essays. Uh, they are talking about uh, humanism and uh, issues to do with how we can relates about politics and the religion in the context of the Malawian society. Basing from what I have written in the book, I am also a humanist. Of course, I have over two decades history of me being a religious person, a Christian. But then around seven to eight years ago, that's when I made the decision to leave the church or religion into humanism. I left up some years of debates of certain things about religion, and then I wasn't dissatisfied from my own conclusions. So I chose to be a humanist, and since then I've been involved in several ways of humanism in Malawi, including the fight against witchcraft-based violence to do with the state and religion, how as a Malawian society can we use the humanism to, to progress ourselves. So these are some of the contextual debates that I do engage with as a, a humanist. What do we need to know about the country of Malawi? Yeah, Malawi is a former British colony. We became independent in July 1964. And from then, we have had successive leadership. The first president was the Dr. Hastings Kamusbanda, who was a strict Christian himself. And in those 30 years when he was in power, the country was much tilted towards the religious part, especially the Christian one. And then after him, we had Dr. Makini Mose, who was the most, but then even though he was a Muslim, he didn't use that position to advance Islam in Malawi. He came into power to a mad party uh, democracy. So he tried all he could to make sure that the country is indeed following the liberal democracy principles. Another thing that we have to know about Malawi is it is one of the most highly religious countries in the world. Close to 98% of the population consider themselves to be religious. And in that percentage, close to 80% Christians dominated mostly by the Catholics and around 15% Muslims and the other small religions like uh, Buddhism, Hinduism. In terms of the economy, uh, it is one of the most poorest countries in the world. Our economy is based on uh, agriculture, which is still at the subsistence level. So you can have an idea that the economy is based on agriculture and then it is not uh, mechanized. Uh, to that extent, the most people living in poverty, we can say close to 80% of the population is living in poverty. And due to that, that has given a lot of fertile ground for religion, 
uh, especially the Pentecostal type of religion, which is promising people shortcuts like riches. These are contexts which have given rise uh, uh, to this issue. It comes to uh, the belief in uh, witchcraft. Last year, we had uh, a survey that was done by a barometer, and uh, it established that over 74% of the uh, Malawian population believe in the existence of uh, witchcraft. And it's just uh, surprising to see that uh, most people use uh, religion in order to ascertain uh, in the uh, witchcraft to exist. Uh, because the Bible says it, uh, so the Bible, I cannot lie. So these are uh, the challenges that we face because when an issue to do with witchcraft has happened, it is hard to convince people that witchcraft doesn't exist because basically uh, trying to fight against the Bible, a book that they consider infallible. What is witchcraft in Malawi? Of course, it has different levels. The one which is popular in a mythical way is the one people believe that some people during the night, the Yiraidi blooms and they go to different places like maybe South Africa or even some people say they do even reach as far as the America. Just within seconds, they start off from here and then they go to these far places. And again, people say the witches do need at the graveyard where they eat the human bodies. But of course, this version of witchcraft is not as popular as it used to be. But the most popular version of witchcraft is the one that people say one can go to a witch doctor and then ask them to do functions uh, in order to alter somebody's life. For example, if he, someone wants to be dead, they will not come to me physically. They will simply go to a witch doctor, instruct him what they want, and the witch doctor is going to mix whatever he has there. And while I'm here, I may simply witness something strange, maybe just falling to the ground or a strange hammer just hitting my head. Or if I have a business and it is prospering, that person can just tell the witch doctor to to make sure that my business should not be working or even my marriage or even my work. So yeah, in general, for most people, they think that witchcraft is when you are using these traditional concoctions to alter somebody's life. In your TED Talk, you talked about a question you used to ask as a younger person. What evidence is there that witchcraft exists? That's one of the questions that I used to have even when I was young. And that question came back when I was uh, trying to discuss issues of religion before I left. That yes, we do believe in witchcraft, but where's the evidence? You are simply surrounded with the, a society that is uh, telling you, everyone in the society is uh, telling you about witchcraft. Like, for example, in my own story, I heard about witchcraft from my uncles, from my cousins. They would simply tell stories about what is happening in the village or standing witchcraft. So those stories, they act like the evidence. You grow up uh, around those narratives and then you conclude that witchcraft is there. And then while after listening to those stories, you can spend maybe 10 to 15 years or even 20 years without witnessing something that is close to the witchcraft description in your life. And then for me, I started wondering that I believe in witchcraft, but then where is the evidence? From that time, I remember engaging with people on the social media of witchcraft and they, they were not providing convincing responses. What happens is when you challenge the belief in witchcraft, people will simply try to threaten you and say something's going to happen to you and all that. If you are someone who is uh, not mentally strong, you easily fall in. But for me, it was a moment where yeah. I was asking these tough questions and the people would threaten me to say, something's going to happen to you, you are going to see and all that. This is uh, close to 10 years ago. And uh, for the past 10 years, I haven't seen anything that these people, they keep on talking up to this uh, very day. So in short, uh, there's no evidence of uh, witchcraft. 
uh, what people consider to be evidence is uh, just the mental analytics that they have. Uh, for example, uh, if the, some, someone has died uh, suddenly, uh, maybe it could be because of uh, hypertension and all that, the conclusion that some, oh, most people are going to make that is that it was a witch cleft the hammer that was the sense to that person. So for them, that is the enough evidence because how can a person simply die just like that? Because if the death has happened, then there must be a certain cause. So if we don't know that cause, then it should be witchcraft. But for a person like me, when it's such an event has happened, I don't use the witchcraft analytics to come to the conclusion. What I would do is simply to ask questions, maybe what sickness was the person suffering? What were the circumstances around the, the death? So from that information, you simply make a conclusion that whenever people do not have enough information about an issue, they run to use witchcraft in order to answer that question. But when you have abandoned that idea and you then begin to doubt that maybe it wasn't, when people have been given the information about a certain strange event that has happened, you start that they start now doubting their own analytics. And this is a challenge in this country because as already said, most people are in poverty and that the informational knowledge that they need to have, maybe about healthy conditions they do not have. When something strange has happened, they simply use witchcraft to ask that. But for a person like me, I look into an issue from all angles. I ask questions that people are not answering. So after that information has been given, you start doubting if the witchcraft is indeed there. But from my experience for the past years, I can conclude hundred percent that the belief only exists when people do not have enough information or knowledge about a certain event in their lives. I thought it was interesting when you mentioned that there was even fear around questioning the evidence or questioning witchcraft may not be true. That's the first harmful practice around accusations is not wanting people to question it because it could bring danger. Yeah. Witchcraft is shooted in sickness, in a darkness. The narrative of witchcraft that we have here is it happens only during the night. Uh, that is when the witches or the wizards meet at the graveyard or wherever they meet and then they do anything that they want to do. So that idea alone simply tells it that you do not have to question the issues that are happening during the night. So if you come out and then start saying witchcraft doesn't exist and all that, then that's a uh, dark world. And uh, if you do that, uh, then something's going to uh, happen to you. And these are the fears that we uh, are given uh, from, uh, from an early age. Uh, people grow around the, uh, these fears into their adulthood. So whenever they hear someone uh, trying to uh, question these issues, they are afraid that something is going to happen to that person. Or if they are connected to that person in any kind of way, if something happens to that person, then it may also reach to them. That's the level of the situation that we have. Uh, but as already said for me in the uh, past 10 years, when I have, I started uh, questioning these things, nothing uh, has uh, happened to me, uh, even though uh, there have been uh, those uh, kind of accidents. And I heard you just talk about night and darkness being a big element of this. That really made me think about some of the historic witch hunting that happened in other countries earlier in history where there might not have been a lot of light available at night. Is Malawi a very dark place at night for lack of lights? I wondered if that is part of it, because I know that did play into some of the fear here in the American colonies. But in the 
context, I, it is not uh, as prominent uh, as the, uh, to that extent. Yes, of course, we do not have uh, adequate uh, electricity connectivity here because it's only 18% of the country that is connected to the national grid. Most parts of the country are dark uh, during the night. But I think the associating which we have to do with the night or darkness is just part of the human history. It may also happen in countries where they do have enough electricity and all that. And that even extends to animals that's usually active during the nights, like the owls. People associated them with me, which a lot. If an owl comes at your house, people will simply conclude that something bad is going to happen in that house. And this is a belief most people have in this country. So you can see an owl is just an innocent animal that naturally is active during the night. But simply because of that, people associate it with the witchcraft. Or even talking of animals like the hyena, they are usually active during the night. So when people are going to the witch doctors, they want to do their concoctions. It's mostly the hyena that is used for their medicine. And how did you come to get involved in the anti-witch hunting advocacy? I still remember clearly the issue that brought me into all this. After a few years of questioning the existence of witchcraft, something happened in January 2016 in a place, a district called Ineno. It's also in the southern Malawi. This is one of the hot spots uh, when it comes to the belief in witchcraft. So in January 2016, four grannies uh, from the same family we are killed uh, by the grandchildren of that very same family because they accused them uh, that they were responsible for the death of one of the young family members. So these young family members went and they gathered these old grannies, made them sit somewhere in the village, and they took uh, fungi knives, stones, sticks, and they beat them to death, four of them. The issue was reported in the media. People were shocked as to how could something as terrible as that happened to them. So when I saw that, I remember going to a certain gentleman called the Georgie Tindo. By then he was famously involved in the anti witchcraft belief in issues. So I went to India and I told him that for the past three years, I have been doubting the existence of witchcraft. Uh, but I feel uh, that doubt is not enough. Uh, looking at what has happened uh, in Neno, I wish I can get involved uh, in this, uh, these issues in uh, one way or another. So by then, he was concluding a project. In this project, he was freeing people who were in prisons across the country that were in prison because they were suspected to be witches. Not that the laws of this country do imprison people when they are said to be witches. No. Actually, the law that we have currently says that uh, witchcraft doesn't exist. And it is against the law to accuse anyone of witchcraft. But what happens is when people are accused in their communities, the community do not want them to be around. And we do not have uh, elderly homes or good social services where they can go for them to live. So what happens is the police simply comes to the communities to get them and keep them in the prisons because that is where they can be. But it is not a good situation because most of those who are accused, the elderly, and among the elderly, it is mostly women. Imagine a woman who is 80 years old, is not wanted by the community, who cannot be anywhere else, and then they are being kept in a prison. So this was the project by then, the organization was called the Association for Secular Humanism. So uh, he tried uh, to work with the government to make sure that these people are out of prisons and that they are taken back into their communities. And uh, it was one of the most successful uh, projects uh, by then. So I offered myself, uh, the project was going into completion. So I promised them, Kim, that what I know is writing, so I will use my uh, lighting, uh, knowledge or skills, 
to make sure that I talk about these issues. And since that time, from around 2015, 2016, I have been doing that to this day. I do write on the issues and I also do talk about the issues in the media houses. Yes, it is a, mostly only me who is a public about these issues. I have a good relationship with the, the media here and they are doing a good job. Whenever something related to which the best violence has happened, they do contact me for a comment and the, that provides a platform where we are trying to see the, educate the masses on issues to do with the police. What is the status of accused being in prison today? To this day, there's uh, no one who is uh, in prison because they were accused of um, witchcraft. The general public, the attitude seems to have changed when you are looking at how it was in 2015 to now. So what happens is whenever an issue has happened and that the community is in towards that individual, temporarily they are taken to the police cells where they are kept in order to look for a lasting solution. So it is the police and the also other organizations, including us, who are involved in the making sure that we negotiate with the community, especially through the traditional leaders, to talk the issues with the family and to make sure that the person goes back to the community. But of course, it is still a threat because if the community thinks that someone is a witch, it's an idea that they have in their minds. They may change it simply because the police have negotiated the issue, but it still remains there. So anything can happen to that's a person. To this extent, I have uh, two examples. Last year, uh, a similar thing happened in the uh, Moranje. Uh, it is a district. Two granite uh, from one uh, We are taken to be beaten uh, to death because they were thought to be behind uh, the death of a certain young family member. The good thing is the police rushed to the scene. They managed to sell these two planets. They were taken to the police cell for around two weeks. So one of the police officers directed us. We tried to gather little things that we had, bags of maize, soap, and anything as basic as possible for their warfare. So we went there with the police. We made the two planets. After we came back, I remember one of the police officers called me and they said that uh, the people in the community, they do not want you to see you again uh, visiting those two planets. Because if you visit them, you are giving them food items. It will encourage them to bewitch even more community members. So I simply wanted to, to take home the point that even though they are back in the community, but their lives are not as safe as they should be. Just two months ago, something similar happened in the Seminole district, uh, which I said earlier on that it is one of the holy spots for this belief. A young family members wanted to beat their grandfather, who is around 80 years old. They accused them of being behind the death of another, another young family member. The good thing is that he was rescued and he was taken to, to a police station for a week. And after the media had reported that issue, he was lucky to be taken into uh, an elderly home. That elderly home is being run by a certain young lady. All the people are being looked after. So after that situation, she volunteered to take that old man into the home. And just a few weeks ago, I was there. By, we donated a few items uh, to the elderly home. And the, I happened to meet uh, that old man from uh, Neno. So he narrated uh, his audio. He was saying that he simply accepted it that he was about to be killed, uh, only to be saved. I went there, I met him. He narrated his audio, and he doesn't think that he will go back to his old home anytime soon. And I remember when I was leaving, he pleaded with me that we should go uh, to his village and talk uh, to the community to convince them about the issues of witchcraft because from his experience, he doesn't want anything like that to happen to uh, anyone else. I was wondering, you had mentioned earlier in the conversation that 
individuals will go and ask for a witchcraft concoction. Are those people, do they get accused if you go and ask for a concoction or are the accused only folks that are not actually going to natural doctor? So I thought that they just who go to the witch doctors, they do it in a secret. You don't even know that someone went to a witch doctor and to ask for concoction. The meetings between uh, people and the witch doctor, sometimes they happen in secret. People don't announce that they are going there. But whatever transpires there is communicated to everyone in the family or the community that I went to the witch doctor and that the witch doctor told me this and that. But sometimes it's an open secret where the family agrees to go to the witch doctor. So they go there as a family and then they come to the community. So these meetings are sometimes while everyone is knowing. How can listeners support you in your advocacy? For us to be effective, we do need resources. Of course, the challenge of the belief as it comes from several different angles. The first one, I have talked about the witch doctors, but now we also have another emerging challenge with the Christian Pentecostal preachers. Whenever people are meeting misfortunes, they go there to the preachers or the prophets, that's what they call themselves. So the prophets, what they brought about is called the prophecy, so they will simply say, you are meeting these misfortunes because uh, a certain aunt uh, in your family went to a witch doctor and she doesn't want to see you uh, prospering. That's one of the major issues. So the people who visit the witch doctors are mostly those in the rural areas. And the people who mostly visit the prophets, mostly those in the, the urban areas. You can see how wide the challenge is. Come out and then start saying uh, witch doctor doesn't exist. I'm not only creating a war with the witch doctors, no, but even with the, uh, the prophets themselves. So they're using uh, the religion uh, in order to threaten me uh, to say I shouldn't be talking about uh, those. So they talk about God is going to curse me. Sometimes they even uh, do phone calls or even uh, send me just anonymous uh, text to say uh, you should stop doing about that. One day God is going to visit you and do this and that. So it's a deep rooted problem, which needs serious kind of advocacy in the media to talk about the issues and the resources will also be needed to go to places where an issue has happened. Because most of what happens now is due to lack of resources. An issue may happen. What we only do is to make sure we alert the police when that issue has happened for so if we are able uh, to go to the community uh, to talk to them about uh, witchcraft issues, I'm sure it uh, depends. Uh, but for now, we are simply operating from, from afar and it's not uh, effective. We also targeted the youth because for the old people, they already made their conclusions about witchcraft. But the youth, they present a certain interesting perspective about the issues. They may believe in the issues of witchcraft, and I have seen this with my own eyes and the experience. When you engage the youth in these matters, they are ready to give it a doubt about the existence of witchcraft because I think with the modern age, new information, the lack of it in the past is not uh, the same as today. So to target the youth, we do say events like this weekend will be at the University of Malawi where students are going to be debating the issues in the country. So these are some of the advocacy areas that we need using the media to visit the police traditional leadership to make sure we directly engage with the, the communities. When it comes to any campaigns or organizations or advocates that are working on general violence against women and children, in Malawi, does that include violence from witchcraft accusations? Is that recognized as part of the discussion? Actually, I have always been talking with the human rights organizations that are working in the gender area. 
when it comes to which captain based the violence, it doesn't come out in organizations that are doing with the women's rights issues. Actually, that's one of the major talking points that I have whenever I meet an organization that is into promoting gender or women's rights to say, yes, we may need the women to get involved economically or in agriculture, but then there's also this issue. So it doesn't come out in as far as I understand the Malawian context. When I talk to the organizations, they do admit that indeed they overlook the issue. In as far as the Malawian context is concerned, it is only humanist Malawi, which is in the forefront, talking about WISCAP. And other organizations, of course, they do get involved in the, the WISCAP to base the violence. But the challenging part is that for them, their approach is uh, saying that WISCAP does exist. They are simply dealing away uh, with the violence and not the belief. Even though we look at them as the colleagues, but uh, this is a major uh, point of uh, difference because you cannot uh, do away with a belief if you uh, still recognize witchcraft and does uh, exist. The, the current uh, witchcraft law says that witchcraft doesn't exist. And the anyone who accuses another that they are practicing witchcraft or they are a witch, they are answerable to the law. So this law was established by the British colonial government in 1911. But last year, the Malawi Law Commission suggested a change in this law. So they wanted the law to change it from saying witchcraft doesn't exist to start saying witchcraft exists. So as a humanist Malawi, we were involved in all advocacy in the media to say that if we change the law, we started recognizing a sense of a witchcraft, then we are going to take the witchcraft to break the violence to its worst. Because for now, people have an excuse to say, if he, the law says witchcraft is there, then he, indeed we do have witches yeah. among us. That is going to be used for them to victimize other people. It is only humanist Malawi that was uh, saying that we do not have to change the law, while all other organizations were saying that we have to, to change the law in order to save a situation about witchcraft based violence. So that's one of the major point of differences. For the other organizations, we do recognize their good work, but in terms of the witchcraft law, I feel that we still have to advocate for the law not to change because if it changes, then it's going to put so many people's lives at risk of accusation. Yes, because one of the things that I was thinking about when you were talking about the prophets and the witch doctors, the belief of the witchcraft is there, but they need to not advocate for the violence. And it doesn't seem like there's a distinction there that if the, the witchcraft is real, then they have to do the hunt, is what it sounds like. Of course, they, for the witch doctors and for the prophets, they do not directly advocate for the violence. But for them, simply to tell someone that your misfortunes are because of this person, that's enough to advocate for the violence. Because what else do we expect that person to yep. do when they go back uh, to the family or the community? And uh, just month ago, we had this similar incident that I'm talking about happening. Family members destroyed the property. They fought each other simply because a prophet had told them that their misfortunes are due to a certain family member. And unfortunately, these prophets are not answerable. I haven't had anything to do with the, maybe a witch doctor or a prophet being arrested or answerable simply because they passed that message by an individual. What the law or the law enforcers, they simply focus on if the violence that has happened. People are just arrested because of a destruction of property or even a destruction of a life. But the accusation part, I haven't the law touching uh, that part. So it simply uh, confirms that even the law enforcers, they believe that uh, witchcraft is there, but then they uh, simply rush to the situation in order to deal with the destruction of property and the life and not the accusation itself. Thank you so much.
Do you have any last words or comments that you would like to make? Yeah, well, for my last word, I will uh, simply use this uh, opportunity to say that there's a lot that needs to be done uh, in order for us to change uh, the situation. Uh, as a humanist Malawi, it's almost on a, uh, a daily basis that uh, an incident to do with uh, which got the best violence is reported. Uh, uh, of course, some issues do not involve uh, the violence. Some people, some issues involve the violence, but due to lack of uh, resources, we simply operate uh, from afar. From our experience, I feel if we continue doing the interventions by and by to change, of course, it's going to uh, take a long time. But what we have to do now is be people in order for them to directly get involved because we haven't had, for example, an issue has happened. We haven't had even the president talking about it, even the ministers talking about it. They run away from the issue. Because if they come out in the public to criticize the violence or even say that witchcraft doesn't exist, then they are going to lose their votes. So because of that, they run away from talking about the issues. But with the good advocacy, as we are doing, as what we will be doing when we get enough resources, I believe the message is going to reach these people for them to also be involved in one way or another in order to fasten the change that we are looking for. And now for a minute with Mary. Dr. Dinesh Mishra, an ophthalmologist by trade and an advocate to end witch hunts. Dr. Mishra has helped hundreds of women who were brutally beaten and ostracized by their communities after being accused as Dayans, the local term for witchcraft used in Chhattisgarh, India. Dr. Mishra has self-funded services for women to be rehabilitated into society by personally offering them financial and legal assistance, as well as helping them find employment, particularly in the health field. These actions helped empower the women to move forward in their lives with confidence. Thank you, Dr. Mishra, for this and the many other ways you continue to advocate to help women in need. Please follow Dr. Mishra on Facebook. You will find he updates his page on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Now here's Sarah with End Witch Hunts News. End Witch Hunts urges collective action to end witch hunting practices worldwide. A witch hunt can happen in any community. At End Witch Hunts, we're dedicated to amplifying the voices of witch hunt victims and educators. Won't you join us? It is up to all of us to speak up about modern efforts to end witchcraft accusation violence. A witch hunt can happen in any community. Listen to, talk about, and use your influence to share our advocacy episodes and the advocate websites. It's an easy thing to do. Witchcraft accusations remain destructive and common. The world is filled with metaphorical and literal witch hunts rooted in unfounded fear of others leading to crimes against innocent individuals every day. You are the key to raising awareness, building social momentum against such violence, and disseminating education about historical, contemporary, and ongoing witch hunting. A witch hunt can happen in any community. Purposely take up for the vulnerable. Call on others to do the same. Doubt the fear, not the humans. It's easy to be a part of the Massachusetts Witch Hunt Justice Project. Sign and share the exoneration petition at change.org forward slash witch trials. Massachusetts residents, engage your representatives, and if you're a voting member of the Massachusetts General Court, lead or collaborate on the amendment effort to secure formal apologies for the accused witches of Massachusetts. Witch hunt memorials and commemorations now take many forms and serve as enduring tangible reminders. On September 16th, 2023, in North Pownall, Vermont, the community dedicated the Legends and Lore Witch Trial Marker to accused witch Margaret Krieger. The event, made possible by Vermont Folklife Center and William C. Pomeroy Foundation, had support from Bennington Museum and Pownall Historical Society. Explore Margaret Krieger's history at Bennington Museum's Haunted Vermont exhibit until the end of this year. The display features the witch trial, vampires, Bennington Triangle, and author Shirley Jackson, the renowned horror writer 
and her first edition books and belongings, including a self-playing music box and the table where she wrote her last novel. We are thrilled to announce that on the December 28th Thou Shalt Not Suffer episode, you will hear from Jamie Franklin, the esteemed curator of the Haunted Vermont exhibit at Bennington Museum. He was a vital member of the research team securing the new memorial marker for Margaret Krieger. Jamie promises a delightful discourse on the museum, Vermont's history, and the intriguing witch trial lore of Pono. The December 20th episode will be the final episode released for the year, but also the final episode released for Thou Shalt Not Suffer the Witch Trial podcast, because Thou Shalt Not Suffer becomes Witch Hunt January 1st. Thank you for supporting our podcast. Your financial contribution empowers our education and advocacy efforts. During this holiday season, include End Witch Hunts in your charitable gifts. We thank you. Visit endwitchhunts.org to contribute and help bring an end to the dark history of witch hunting practices. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. And thank you for listening to Thou Shalt Not Subvert, the Witch Trial podcast. Join us next week. Subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Visit thoushaltnotsuffer.com. And remember to tell all your friends our name is changing to Witch Hunt on January 1st. Support our efforts to end witch hunts. Visit endwitchhunts.org to learn more. Have a great today and a beautiful tomorrow. Thank you.